let's go ahead and get started. Yes, because it is two o'clock. We'll cover some of the announcements and, you know, people are going to learn after a while. If you tune in late, you miss these valuable announcements with information, good information about the hobby and our people. Yes, and Fred's right. We do have a guest from Division 12. Could you just unmute yourself for a second and introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm sure your name is not the Dows. We can hear yeah, you. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay, yeah, I'm Dale from Division 12. Okay, You're thanks welcome. for thanks for joining us. So, a couple of reminders: uh, same place, same time next week, next Saturday, right here is our monthly general meeting. And Russell, could you say a couple of words about uh, the presenter after the general meeting? Yeah, thanks, uh, Ron. Uh, uh, Phil uh, Galib uh, from um, one of our other uh, divisions, uh, the, the uh, Dayton division, will uh, give his uh, uh, clinic talk on uh, uh, kit bashing uh, uh, a narrow gauge engine. And I think I mentioned this a couple weeks ago that uh, although uh, probably many of us uh, uh, in our area uh, don't do narrow gauge, I mean, the same uh, skills and uh, examples are going to apply to uh, just about anything, uh, any scale that you're kit bashing. So it should be very, very interesting to have him. So uh, tune in for that next week. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Russell. And don't forget, today is the last day. Just got an entry from, uh, from Rick. Uh, Cabooses is our contest. And today is the last day to submit entries. So if you have a caboose, that you'd like to submit to the contest for the month of May, get it in before Mickey's hands are on the 12, please. A couple other quick reminders. Uh, we were talking before the meeting. Uh, Mr. Frank Crone brought it up about the NMRA convention uh, in July from the 6th to the 10th. Bay Rails. I posted back on April 28th a link that you can go and register for that convention. There is a fee to register for the online clinics. It's a one-time fee for the whole segment of $49. And the concept is, is that the, the presentations will all be recorded, but the clinician will be online live to answer any questions after uh, the recording is shown, the idea being that there won't be any glitches in terms of losing people. Some of you who attended our last get together with Spring Creek model trains can relate to that. There won't be any interruptions in the presentation. And last but not least, we've started to publicize Indie Junction 2022 next May, May 2022, the 18th to the 22nd, right up the road in Indianapolis. So start paying some attention to that. I would highly suggest that you put it on your calendar because it's just a couple of hours up the road for a multi-day regional, tri-regional, tri-regional convention. Three regions have come together along with now the Chicagoland RPM, RPM, uh, what is it, Fred? Consortium. No, they're calling themselves the RPM Conference now. It's there. not RPM. It's not Chicagoland RPM. It's not Chicago. It's not Naperville. It's the RPM Conference. Right. Conference. So they're gonna they're gonna be a part of the convention. So all those RPM guys will be there. Dimensional loads is today's topic. We have three presenters. Uh, we're gonna start off with Mike Barry, who's gonna tell us dimensional loads from the perspective of the railroad. And then we're going to have a few words from Steve Lasher, who's driven dimensional roads out on the open tracks to give the engineer's perspective on how to deal with it and follow, last but not least, our own load expert, model railroad expert, Mr. Bob Francone, nationally recognized author and clinician. <laughs> Hardly an expert. I'll, I'll correct you on that. I am not an expert. Uh, you know a lot, though. Okay. Take it away, Mike. Mike still well, here? Yeah, there he is. Thank you, Ron. Appreciate that. As most of you know, probably not all of you, most of you know, I work for 
the Norfolk Southern and its predecessor railroads for 41 years. Gee, I'm old. At any <laughs> rate, um, I was a uh, carman most of the time there and as such did all the usual carman jobs, uh, including, including the one that I'm going to be talking about here in a couple of moments. Um, open loads, dimensional loads, high wides, what's all the terminology? Well, kind of open loads, open top loads include everything you would think. A load of coal is an open top load. A load of lumber, open top load. It's the, the larger umbrella terminology. Uh, what we're gonna talk about today, all of us, are, are the smaller portion of open loads, and that is the dimensional loads, more commonly referred to as high and wides. Uh, the loads that have to be measured and handled uh, differently than all the other loads. Uh, and so that's our, that's our topic today, is uh, the, uh, the open loads um, and the, uh, the dimensional load part of that. As I mentioned in my job, um, one of the tasks that I inherited and then kept for several years was the, the guy for Norfolk Southern in Louisville that took care of, of uh, getting clearance files started on loads originating here in the Louisville area. Now for the NS, uh, not a huge number of loads uh, originated here in, in the Louisville area, but, but enough. And, and so through the years, I've worked with all kinds of different junk you can see stacked on top of a flat car. It's amazing what they haul around on a railroad sometimes. I, uh, I kept the job for so many years, basically because I couldn't get anybody else interested in working with me to learn the job. They would come out with me on a, on a, on a particular load and I would show them how it had to be inspected, how it had to be measured. And then we would get to the part about uh, making sure you had to be accurate and why you had to be accurate. In other words, the responsibility that came with your, your calculations. And that would be the end of that person wanting to help on that job. So uh, to the day I retired, there, nobody else wanted that job at, and lo locally. I assume, I assume somebody's been doing it in the 11 years since I retired, but, uh, but yeah, I'll talk a little more about where all the responsibility comes in a little bit later. But uh, I kind of enjoyed it. Um, it. It was a lot of fun for me. Normally what happens when they, someone decides they have a load they have to ship, they of course normally know what it weighs and the overall size, the dimensions of it. They contact the railroad and say, I got widget XYZ needs to go to Hoboken or wherever. And so then that gets the process started, it gets the ball rolling. Um, the railroad then decides what kind of car they need and then they hustle that car up empty wherever they can find one and get it routed to that customer, that person that needs it. Uh, and then in the process, the, the person that's loading it whether it's the company that actually has the load or they're contracted out to someone else, uh, they hopefully would then contact the railroad to get the official AAR diagram, which I'll talk a lot more about here in a, in a few minutes, uh, for that particular type of load so they could get it secured correctly. And it, when they did that, uh, then uh, they could uh, get the load uh, load it on the flat when they receive the flat and then get it secured. And then at that point, I would get involved. I would get a phone call saying it was ready to be inspected and measured. And that's where things got more fun for me. Um, the AAR has a whole batch of, of 
diagrams, documents, all nested together, and it's something called the open top loading rules. Uh, when I was working, they were all in binders, loose leaf binders. There were seven of them, seven binders full of all the stuff you needed to know on open top loads and how to load them. Um, binder number one was all the general rules. That one contained all of the do's and don'ts, all the things you, you're supposed to do, all the things you better not do when you load and when you secure a load. Also included in that book one were all the specifications for all the material that you use to secure the load. The, the oak, the undressed oak, uh, the, the tie rods, the, the steel banding, uh, the cables. All those things had specifications and they were all listed there in that binder book number one. Um, and then in the other six binders, uh, each one of those was a specific category of, of loads, such as one of them was military loads, another one was farm equipment, uh, another one was building materials, and, and so on from there. So each each separate binder had a just one category of loads in it to make it a whole lot easier to find what you were looking for. And I got some some of those, a couple of those drawings I'll show you here in a couple of minutes too. Uh, that was then. Now, all of those drawings are, are online and available to the public. In fact, that's where I got the drawings that you're going to see here in a few minutes. They are all there. Anybody can go look them up. Uh, they're extremely boring, probably, to most people. Uh, but there are folks out there that are loading loads and, and need to know this stuff. And now it's easy to access. It, it's right there and it's, and it's open. You don't have to have a, you know, a secret handshake to get in. Um, so I got the phone call, time to go take a look at this thing. So for me, after grabbing the appropriate binder, whatever it, it happened to be, and all of my measuring stuff that I had, I had to go to the location where they loaded the car because obviously the car couldn't move until it was cleared to move. It sat right where it was. So then once I got on site, the first thing I did was get the drawing out, the diagram, and compare it to the load that I'm looking at. And compare and make sure it was properly secured to match the diagram. The AAR diagrams are the only item you can use to secure a load. It has to look exactly like that diagram or it's not gonna go anywhere, it won't move. If it doesn't look like what AAR says it's supposed to look like, then, then it won't go anywhere. Um, now, let me show you here, if I can share my screen, show you a, a diagram or two here, what we're talking about. And here we go. How am I doing this here now? There we go, sorry. All right, first one up, you see, this is an actual uh, download of one of their uh, diagrams. This happens to be figure 1B, and you notice the title, Transformer, 775,000 pounds or less on a depressed center flat car. First drawing you see right here is, a, of course, a top view. And this was a, the, the side view. Don't pay attention to this picture. It's kind of confusing. We'll talk a little bit about just the, the top one and the, uh, and the side view here, right here. All right. Now, this is what the person tying the load down would need to know ahead of time so he could get his materials and equipment and people, all that in order, uh, in order to get this job done. Uh, once you set the transformer on the flat, then you got to get all this other stuff on it, around it, next to it, uh, to satisfy this drawing and to satisfy people like me. So if I would show up at, for this transformer, then I would have to check these items. Now you notice uh, right here, we've got these little circles with letters in them. Uh, I'll show you the second page of this uh, diagram that tells you what those mean and, and, and spells out exactly what they are. But notice right here, these are the tie rods, of course, 
and you notice they're 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 marked B. Um, so uh, let's uh, move down here. This is the second page with the same diagram, and you notice right here where it says B tie rods, and there's used four of them on a transformer up to 50,000 pounds or less. You gotta have eight tie rods if it's from 50 to 50 to 500,000. And then there's a little wiggle they use here to get all the way up to 775,000. So each of those tie rods, by the way, have to be one inch in diameter threaded on both ends. As it says here, they have to pass through lifting lugs on the transformer and then through the car deck and then secured with doubled one inch full size nuts. And then you can have some alternate locations. And then, and then the next sentence, uh, it can be substituted by a steel cable of equal or greater strength. Here again, that first book, that book one, the general one I mentioned, would tell you what size cable you would need to equal or, or exceed a one inch diameter tie rod in tensile strength. So then you see the C and the D, and those are the, the pieces of steel that go against the bottom of the transformer to keep it from shifting. Tie rods keep it from, from toppling over, the blocking around the bottom of it, the, the, the welded on parts keep it from shifting on the car. So all of that has to be uh, exactly like you see it right here, or it can't move. It's got to be, and, and there's no, no wiggle room there. Uh, this is it. Um, now we have another one here, and this one's a whole lot more difficult to, to see. When I downloaded it, I had to do a file um, exchange in order to get them onto this PowerPoint. And for some reason, this farm tractor tires turned into dotted lines. But hopefully you can kind of see the basic outline of a tractor right there. And then all, whoop, and then all of these um, items here that denote the different things to tie it down. This theoretically is a top view of that tractor. This is a side view of just the, the big rear wheel of the tractor. And these, you'll, these are wires to tie it down. Now, here are the different types of wood blocking, how they have to be cut, all the sizes to block the front and the back of the tractor to keep it obviously from shifting. And then here, just like on the transfer or on the transformer load, you see all of the item uh, letters and what they um, denote right down to the wire that you tie the, the, the tractor tires to the flat car with. It's called number nine wire. Um, it's like six gauge steel or six gauge uh, solid wire, uh, if you can vision that, only made out of steel. You bend it, you, you uh, wrap it around the tire and then you stick like a, a, a bar of some kind through there and you twist it uh, to get it, to tighten it up. But that's two different items out of several hundred that are listed in those books. Uh, I just, well, hooey. I just brought that, uh, brought these here to uh, to show, and we'll come back to that one later. Let's go back to how do we go back to me? Just if you want to just go back to your. There we yeah. go. All right there now. There's a story I have, and probably maybe a couple of you have heard this from me, and I apologize, but uh, it it. it highlights quite a bit the some of the issues I got into when I was inspecting these loads. Uh, General Electric was shipping a great big uh, injection molding machine out of their plant going wherever, I forget now, it doesn't matter, uh, just on a simple flat car. But it was a quite a dimensional load. And, and so we got a phone call one day to come out and take a look at it. And so I went out there and it didn't look anything like it was supposed to. It was tied down, but it was, it was obvious this person either didn't know or didn't care about the AAR drawings because it was just 
hooked to the car and that was the end of it. Uh, so I had a contact number. So I called this gentleman and he said, I'll be right there. So this guy shows up in a few minutes and he was smoking by the time he got there. And he said, what do you mean it's wrong? I said, well, and I had my drawing right there and I said, see this, this is what it's supposed to look like. And what you have is nothing like this. He said, why should I care about what that drawing says? I said, because your car is not gonna move until it looks like this. Well, I'm an engineer. And he said, I said, and he said, that'll work. I said, I'm not an engineer. And I'm telling you, it's gotta look like this piece of paper or it's not going anywhere. And so we went back and forth and back and forth. And he just kept getting madder and madder because obviously it was gonna cost him some serious coin to, uh, to fix this. And, and he, you know, he thought at some point I would just say, oh, well, never mind, you know, and, and okay it, which there was no way I could or nor would I. And finally he said, let me talk to your boss. So I picked up my phone and I said, here, you tell him. Gave me my phone. And of course, my boss said the same thing I did. You know, he said, until it looks like what it's supposed to look like, it's not going anywhere. So that guy probably lowballed the job to start with, thought he had a good plan, came in there and and put some stuff down and said, that'll be fine, it'll work, and, and, and then left, you know? And so now he, had to, now he had to come back and take off all that and put back on what was supposed to be on there just because he either didn't know or didn't care to check the drawing first. So yeah, I, uh, I had two or three instances like that of people that, that would uh, threaten me with all kinds of stuff because I didn't okay their loads. But it was pretty cut and dry for me. I didn't really, you know, it was uh, was not a big issue. So once I got past the, in the initial inspection part and decided that it was properly secured and it was okay to travel, then the next big part of my job was actually measuring this load. Um, all loads that were wider than the car floor and taller than about 20 feet. And that kind of was a, a, a moving target, but um, any loads that were high and wide all had to, have, had to be measured and, they, and something called a clearance file had to be created for that car. And then it followed it uh, until it was actually unloaded on the, uh, on the other end of his journey. Uh, this file, was of course, a, a, even back in the dark ages when I worked, uh, it was a, a computer uh, generated item. And what I had to do basically was create a, a profile or a silhouette, if you will, a cross section of that load, highlighting the highest points and the widest points. And I'll show you a little more specifically how I did that. And then that way the computer could electronically, you know, move the car across its route, its intended route to see if it cleared or not. And if it didn't clear some point along the way, then, then the car of course would have to be rerouted in some other direction so that it would clear. So that clearance file is, is, was very important for these high wide loads. But this is where it got tricky because in order to create this clearance file, um, you had to get multiple sets of measurements. Every point that, that was wide or high or whatever on this load had to have a height and a width at that point. In other words, it was a location uh, for that particular point, be it a wide place or, or a, a high place. And, and so they would uh, you had to have at least three sets of those measurements, no matter how simple the load might have been. I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint now. I hope. There it comes. All right. I don't know why I have to do this, but okay. There you All go, right, Mike. Now, here we go. Um, Here is out of that, the book number one. It shows you, even shows you how to measure. Now this is a little sketchy and it's a way too busy a drawing. 
So I apologize for that, but this is the official drawing that's supposed to show you how to measure stuff. But you see down here, you see those are the wheels of the car. And then from right here across, that's actually supposed to represent the floor of the car itself. And in this line, this is some random drawing of a, some kind of a piece of machinery, but this is, the, this is the actual load itself following this line here, you see, and then across the bottom. So that's the load. So in order to turn in a clearance file, you had to have a minimum of three points measured on this load. This particular load would take a lot more than that. But without getting too technical, all of the measurements of height were from the top of the rail up. And that's just so everything has got a common point. You didn't measure from the car floor up, you actually measured from the rail up. So the heights would be uh, from, the, from the rail all the way to the top of the load or to that point. Um, and, and so it was, uh, it was interesting to try to keep up with all of that too. Um, I had a, a, a tool made that I could slide under the car and it would hook the rails so that it would create a straight edge that would come out past the side sill of the flat car where I could actually get a measurement to the to the top of the rail there from the outside of the car. But now the width of the car, that was actually, if you were measuring this corner right here, let's say, to measure that width, you would measure from the center line of the flat car. That's what this line represents, center line of the car floor. You would measure from there out to that point and double it. Reason being is that, as you see in this case, it's not as wide on this side as it is on this side, just looking at the drawing. So if you just measured from here across to here, you would have a misrepresentation if there was a, a clearance point on one side only, say it was the side of a, a bridge or a telephone pole or what have you. Um, so by measuring from the center line of the car to the wide point and doubling it, it didn't matter which way the car was turned when it went by this uh, particular clearance point, clearance issue, it would fit because it, it didn't matter which way the car was turned. You had it by the measuring and then doubling that wide point, you had it covered no matter which way the car was turned. Hopefully that's not too confusing. And then, uh, and then you would just carry up, measure the height and width at whatever points you needed to measure, and then uh, including the top. And as you see on this little drawing, it's it's flat a bit across the top, but you see the flat's not centered. So here again, you would measure from here to here that 2.6 it has marked there, and then you would double that, and that's what you would show as the width at that extreme height. So that's kind of a quick and dirty on how you measure stuff. Um, and of course, tanks, round things like this were a whole lot simpler. Uh, it just sometimes it's hard to get up here to measure things like these uh, manways or, or, or flanges. Uh, but, but, you know, because it was round, it, it didn't have all these angles and extra pieces sticking out of it, uh, you know. Like this flange way wouldn't be much to measure because it was inside the extreme width. This one looks like if you plumb bobbed it, it might it might stick out past there. So then that would be another point you'd have to make. And this is supposed to be like a tracked vehicle here. But yeah, my tools included, besides that little gizmo to that rail straight edge, I had a expanding measuring pole so I could measure up to the height of a lot of things without having to get a ladder and climb up, which I did on some loads. Uh, also included a, a plumb bob with a really long string on it, uh, you know, a level, tape measure, pencil pad, all the stuff you would expect. Um, and, and, the, and then you would just kind of keep going. And I would just, let's do this, here we go. And here's just some more uh, different types of loads and the way you would measure them. This one is a, obviously a double load. 
and it would be on uh, bolsters. One, you see one here and you see another one here so that when the cars went around the curve, the, the load would swivel. Uh, so those bolsters had to be on swivels. And then here's the next step up from that. And this would be a, a triple load, of course. You see here, three flats. The bolster would be here and then all the way down here on this one. There wouldn't be anything here. This is basically just an idler in the middle for a, for a triple load. And then another version would be a single end overhang. You see the flat here and you see the load sticking out over here. Um, and then we would have it tied down here, no need for bolsters, of course, and it would be tied down here on the floor of, the, of this flat and just hang out over the idler. Now, you might wonder, maybe, maybe not, why you would use an overhang load or why you would go to the trouble of doing a double load with bolsters, uh, like you see here, as opposed to an overhang load well, as a couple things went into that, the main one would be maybe this thing is too heavy to put all of its weight on one car. This way, the weight is spread over two cars for one thing. The other thing is, obviously, you can only handle so much overhang before it, in a curve it hangs out too far past the side of the car in a curve and causes real havoc. And, and that had to be measured very carefully how much overhang there actually was. And the computer calculated all of that in the curvature and all to decide whether it was going to be a clearance issue. And then here you had a double end overhang load. Once again, all of the weight is on the one flat car tied down here. And then it's got an overhang over two idlers, one each way. And those are a real pain on the, on the road. Steve can probably talk about that a little more later. Hey, um, Mike, I have a question, uh, Bob Frankron. Um, yeah. On that, uh, if you'd slide down to, to do the triple car where it's bolstered on the on the first and third car. Okay, so I understand the bolsters, it has to pivot, obviously, but does yeah. it also allow slack to move in the in the X and Y axis there? Because when you, you know, on, on a straight track, right, as soon as you curve that, you know, it 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 seems like it would have to slide one way or the other because, you know, as you as you curve curved track you know the your load is still straight so it's going to make an arc right yep so it you seems like engineer in you bob well i'm i'm, I'm just curious. i've often wondered about that i mean it, yeah. you know because the the prototype photos i've looked at they they just seem like they pivot and not really slide one way or the other and and especially on, on a double car maybe you can get a uh, get away with it but on a triple car you know that it's going to be more pronounced that 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 arc yeah good question bob one thing to a uh, couple things there first off the uh, the bolsters had about best i remember only about three inches of longitudinal play in them like you're talking about okay forward and back and that's all okay they could pivot well 360 degrees if it god forbid but they uh, they had a they had a slot in them, but it was only about three inches long. Okay, that's because probably the prototype curves, unlike my model railroad, are a lot broader and not oh, as yeah. not as tight. So, and the um, other thing, and the other thing that goes into that that's not in this drawing is that the slack is removed between the cars. Ah, uh, yeah, alone. yeah, but, good, good but point. Between the the back of the coupler head and the. Uh, face of the uh, end cell, we put steel blocks in there just to, so that the couplers couldn't uh, retract any. There was no, no slack action there. And we did that um, between the, 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 on the two joints underneath the load so that the three cars didn't uh, move in and out like you would expect they would. That was taken away from them that way. Uh, we blocked it out uh, so that your uh, curvature thing that three inches on each end was probably way more than it needed to handle that. And then the actual slack action was was gone. So yeah, it, they just didn't want these things flopping around. That's the deal. They want they had to pivot, but they didn't want them loose. Thank you. Yeah. All right. We need to kind of finish up here, Mike, because we're 
we're running okay. a little bit long on time. If you okay. have any f final points to make. And if yeah, I mentioned responsibility a little while ago, and I just want to quickly point out that the, uh, the responsibility for my job came in the actual measurement. Because you can imagine the higher the load, the wider the load, the more critical the measurements became. Because a mistake, if you made a mistake on the measurements and turned them in wrong, uh, you know, you could take out the side of a bridge, you know, knock down a whole row of telephone poles or, you know, choose some other disaster not counting the damage to the load itself. And, and some of these loads are multi-million dollar items. So you had to be right. You know, in other words, I would, you know, you, you measure it like three times. And, and, you know, so you would, you would have to get it right. It wasn't any give or take there. And, and so you, uh, but the nice thing is once I put my data into that clearance file in a computer, my job was done. And that's where, Transportation Department took over. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. If there's any other questions, let's save them for Mike at the end, if we don't mind, so we can move along to Mr. Steve Lasher. I was backed up here a little bit uh, ahead of Mike, but Mike covered most of what, uh, what I had to say here. This all begins with the shipper contacting the railroad's traffic department and say, hey, look, I have this blah, blah, blah that we need to ship from here to there. Uh, it weighs this. It's uh, this or its approximate dimensions. And um, the ball starts rolling from there. Uh, and most railroads have what they call a movement bureau. It may go by other names, but uh, at least it was on the Rock Island and the SP Cotton Belt. Uh, which specialized in pro making provisions and handling the, these uh, excessive dimension shipments. And by the way, since Mike mentioned it, if you have a copy of uh, the official railway equ equipment register, I can't remember if it's in the very front or the very back, but uh, they give diagrams in there. I I'm sure you've all seen cars from the 60s and 70s that had a stencil on the side that said exceeds plate C. Well, these plates are all laid out in that uh, uh, official railway equipment register and the dimensions for each plate are given in there uh, with a diagram sort of like Mike was showing you with the end of the car, uh, whatever. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, so anyway, this, I say it starts the ball rolling. The car supply folks have to come up with a suitable car and they have to get it to the to the shipper. Uh, now, uh, on flat cars, especially like depressed center flat cars or whatever, uh, uh, Mike and I were talking and we both agreed there's hardly a, a piece of equipment on the railroad that's more, uh, suffers more abuse and unloved than flat car decks. And uh, the, the shipper who received the load usually doesn't worry about doing any more to the car than what he has to do in order to get the load off of it. So when the car is spotted for the new shipper, they may have to spend half a day or a day working with cutting torches and whatever to get the old uh, load securement, the dunnage, off of the car and get it ready uh, and, and suitable for them to put their load on it. Uh, but in any case, uh, they, uh, they begin the process of loading the car, the movement, movement bureau, knowing the rough dimensions, uh, can plot strategy about a route. And sometimes if a load is very large, uh, it may wind up having to travel a very circuitous route uh, in order to avoid clearance issues. Uh, and if it's gonna be interchanged to other railroads, uh, they of course have to contact the other railroads and they go through the same process uh, uh, to try to determine the route. And then we get to the part where uh, notice will give, be given to the car department. Uh, Mike will get that phone call. He'll have to go out and make accurate measurements. Uh, and then once they know the final measurements, they can determine whether the proposed route is going to work or whether they're going to have to make modifications. So anyway, uh, it all boils down to uh, the part where it's actually out on the on the railroad to go from point A to point B. 
uh, and this is just a uh, an attempt at humor here because this is actually uh, a shot of the government bridge uh, that went from Arsenal Island to Davenport, Iowa, uh, and it had a swing span on it that opened over the the locks uh, on the uh, the dam across the Mississippi was just to the left out of the picture. And I said, the Corps of Engineers took a really dim view of damaging their bridge. Uh, you could supposedly be banned off this if they turned you in for speeding, and they had a very strict 10 mile an hour speed limit across it. And if they turned you in for speeding, you could supposedly be banned from operating across the government bridge. But uh, in any case, the reason I put that in there was the Rock Island used to handle uh, loads of airplane wings going to Boeing in in Seattle, and uh, we invariably would wind up have having measured measure. Excuse me, I'm trying to say this. Uh, uh, no, no, not measured. Uh, wires messages is saying to stop and hand flag the government bridge, and uh, so and that's what the government bridge looked like. Uh, but in any case, I say we got handfuls of wires. This is one I had that I put together for a load of uh, uh, M60 tanks that uh, are actually on Russ's layout at the moment. But uh, if you can't read it very well, I'll, I'll go through it briefly. Uh, you'd get a message like this along with your train orders and clearances and other paperwork. Uh, and after you got through all the people that it was addressed to, it, you would get down to the, uh, to the important part uh, for the train crews. And uh, the, uh, the pertinent part for the train crews was this, where it says cars to be thoroughly inspected prior to acceptance from the MP uh, and to be left with Missouri Pacific until the, the, any deficiencies are corrected uh, and that they are to be entrained immediately behind the engines of the trains handling. So do not meet trains handling wide loads on curves or at any locations without ample clearance. Uh, usually the dispatchers would, would take care of this, but sometimes you had to adjust to say if you were going to meet somebody uh, that was handling wide loads, you'd have to figure out how one of the trains could get the wide load uh, further away. So they would miss each other. But uh, in any case, uh, and say do not meet trains handling wide loads on curves or at any location without ample clearance. Every precaution to be taken to ensure clearance. Cars must be must not be left on yard tracks or other tracks with substandard clearances. Loads must be carefully inspected at every opportunity by trainmen and carmen to ensure loads properly secured and centered on cars. Uh, they could shift. It did happen, uh, even in spite of all the blocking. But uh, you were supposed to, you're supposed to look at them every chance you could. Which meant that if you were stopped uh, at a meeting point and you were in a siding, that the head brakeman was supposed to get off and go back and look at them. Uh, and then uh, there's a biggie here: these cars must not be humped nor cut off in motion under any circumstances. Uh, Mike and I were talking the other day. I, it's hard to appreciate the violence that can happen in switching cars. If uh, you know, if the foreman underestimates uh, uh, the speed when they're kicking cars, or the, the they're let go too fast uh, over a hump, uh, it can be pretty bad. Uh, but anyway, they, it also goes on to say they must be carefully shoved to a coupling with other equipment or ridden to rest. Uh, and then there's a little note down here, car department in Memphis to arrange joint inspection with ICG to facil facilitate prompt interchange at Memphis. Now, uh, the next little phrase, if you understand railroad talk, the railroad east, it says, see no failure to comply these instructions. When you saw that in a message, what that meant is if anything happened to these cars and you could be uh, blamed for it in any way, that you could expect to talk to the typewriter. And you better hope that your job insurance was paid up because you were probably going to get uh, an unpaid vacation from the railroad. Uh, but uh, if that's always the little kicker phrase that, that meant, you, you know, don't let anything happen or it's your butt. Uh, this is sort of a message that uh, 
I thought would be appropriate for Russ's uh, transformer load on his railroad. Uh, and uh, Wick says cars to be closely inspected and final measurements made at GE Transformer Division at East Syracuse before load is accepted for shipment and movement bureau is to be notified of same before car will be moved. Car to be left at GE until any deficiencies are corrected and the movement bureau is to be notified of all particulars per this occurrence. Uh, that says uh, cars to be closely observed at all times by crews handling to ensure adequate clearances are maintained. Overhead and top side clearances must be closely watched with this load. In any case of doubt, load is to be carefully hand flagged. And then it has some route restrictions, which wasn't uncommon at all uh, to, to get in your message. Uh, in our case, it says uh, Buffalo Central Terminal must use bypass track only, will not clear overhead walkways on platform tracks. And we'll show you this here in just a minute. Uh, West Buffalo Tower must not be moved on number two track account insufficient clearance of the tower may use crossover from number one track to number two track to move to Cleveland Division. Uh, and it's all concerned, take every precaution to see no damage to this load. Uh, up at the top, it did mention that it's supposed to be handled as a special movement by itself or with other dimensional shipments and a special train only. Uh, that was not all that uncommon. You used to see, uh, and it's probably still can, uh, just an entire train of nothing but high wide loads. It, I, the thought was it be better to keep all your bad eggs in one basket uh, to keep an eye on them. Uh, but in any case, uh, it says if necessary to set out or run, or run to terminal as bad order, account hot box or any mechanical failure, wire must be sent at first available means of communication, notifying division superintendent, movement bureau, and general manager's office of the particulars. Uh, any questions or concerns to be addressed promptly with the Movement Bureau and their instructions will govern. And then you get the, the little, it's, it's your butt phrase here, see no failure to comply with these instructions. Uh, <laughs> uh, and this is why it had to operate on number one track at West Buffalo. Uh, and, and Russ can tell you that uh, that's really and truly the case, uh, which we didn't know that ahead of time, but uh, uh, there are problems trying to get by there with that load. Uh, and of course, this guy has been standing out here for months now waiting for this load to come along, but it's amazing how he manages to keep his hands up. Uh, and this is why it can't go under the uh, canopy there on the, uh, the passenger stairways at Buffalo Central Terminal. And, uh, so on the railroad, railroad uh, you know, the Movement Bureau knows where all these uh, issues are. Frequently, the, uh, sometimes the railroad has to be remeasured. They used to have uh, uh, special cars for measuring clearances. Uh, they had a multitude of fingers sticking out of them. Uh, and they could either do that one of two ways. They could either be checking the clearances because the dimensions of the railroad did change from time to time. I mean, if they ran a, a, a tie renewal or a track renewal program and the, the railroad got reballasted and resurfaced, it could wind up a few inches higher than it had been. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and they could also set the fingers on these clearance cars to match the particular size of a load and run it over the route and, and see if any problems cropped up. Uh, but uh, the main thing that you, you wound up doing on as you actually handled the load was you had to comply with whatever instructions were given you. And you also had to be uh, on your toes and thinking ahead a little bit in, in case somebody missed something. Uh, I mean, you could assume that the dispatcher would know if another train had wide loads or not, but it wasn't, all, uh, wasn't a bad idea to uh, mention it, make sure he, he was aware of it. Uh, if you were meeting another train, it wasn't a bad idea to ask him, you don't have any dimensional loads, do you? Because uh, things could, you know, if there was a way for it to go wrong on the railroad, it would. So uh, you just had to be on your toes. Uh, and frequently looking back, uh, you were supposed to inspect your train 
at every curve anyway. Uh, but uh, in any case, if you had wide loads or whatever, it was a good idea to keep a good uh, a good eye on them because uh, they could and, and would move sometimes. Uh, the very first tr trip I made uh, on the railroad was following another train one night and he had a load of combines on a flat car and the conveyor arm broke loose on one of the flat cars or one of the com combines, knocked down almost all the signals between uh, West Ave Junction and, and West Liberty. Uh, they were all either laying over on their side in the ditch or turned around backwards or whatever. Uh, so uh, clearance issues are a big deal on the railroad. Well, no, uh, you know, Russell said we didn't go very fast. Well, no, because a, uh, a signal improperly displayed has to be regarded as the most restrictive signal indication that signal can give. So we didn't get over 20 miles an hour anywhere. And they eventually set the car out at West Liberty. <laughs> when it went by the operator, he's like, hey, wait a minute, this doesn't work. So uh, anyway, that was the that was the game when you actually were trying to get over the road with these cars. Uh, onward. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Very informative and some good demonstrations of what you have to look out for. Let's make Mr. Frank Crone here a co host real quick. That should be taken care of now, Bob. All right. Hey, thanks, Steve. Thanks, Mike. Uh, you know, I've been building these things for a while and, you know, didn't know a lot of what you, what I learned here today. So, I've always put the cart before the horse, I guess. Uh, in any case, so I'm going to follow on with some uh, photographs of some very uh, large, uh, I call them extra large, and now I know they're called dimensional loads. A couple of disclaimers before I begin. <clears throat> Unlike Mike and Steve, I do not have a prototype railroad background, but I have been building open load models for nearly 40 years. I model what I like, not necessarily what is prototypically correct. I'm glad Mike doesn't have to inspect my model loads before I can put them on the layout. They probably fail every time. So some models in this presentation may be offensive to rivet counters, so beware. And disclaimer three, some of the photos in this presentation were not taken by me. Many were given to me, and I have some copied from other sources. You know, ever since I've, uh, for the last three years, uh, since I've started writing the uh, feature for loads in the NMRA magazine, people from all over the country send me photos of open loads that they've taken or whatever. So they send them to me, and sometimes I reply and say, thank you very much. Can I use it in my presentation? Oh, absolutely. Do, do whatever you want with it. It's yours now. So uh, in that case, uh, uh, I'll use them. So let's look at some very large, or maybe I should change that to dimensional prototype loads. This is a steam generator for a nuclear power plant. It was featured in a 2000 article in the NMRA magazine uh, by a gentleman named uh, Gary Lazell. Gary's a friend of mine. He's the one who I mentioned earlier in, when I showed this photo in my clinic, he raised his hand and says, that's my photo. <laughs> uh, but anyway, he's, uh, he's a great guy and he, he was flattered actually that I used it. Um, <clears throat> the thing I like about this particular load, it's one of those double car loads. And you talk about your specialty flats. Each one of those flat cars or two flat cars have four three axle trucks for a total of 12 axles, 24 wheels per car. So a total of 48 wheels to haul this monster. And they put dimensional, the load is so large, a couple of things. This, these marks right here, those denote the center of gravity for the load. This area right here, has some other data on it that the manufacturer put on it. And it's very difficult to read, but right here, the net weight, 401 tons. 
and the gross weight, because you've got all the hardware that this thing is mounted upon, 436 tons. So you can see why you need 24 axles, 48 wheels to, uh, to haul this thing. And that the earlier photo it was sitting on an exchange track, actually. And I saw one of the, I don't know if Mike or Steve said, it says, don't, don't leave on tracks that didn't have a lot of clearance or whatever. Uh, but in the previous photo, that's an exchange track or an interchange track, not an exchange, interchange track, uh, I think in Rockford, Illinois, which is uh, where, where Gary lives and took the photo. And <clears throat> you're right. Going through bridges, uh, the clearances, I mean, there isn't uh, a whole lot of room uh, in there. The reason I put this load in here is because Atherin Blue Box Kits uh, had this car. It's a four truck, heavy duty flat car. And uh, it's uh, front two trucks here are attached to a single unit that's bolstered from the bottom. And so it pivots on both both ends of the car. But I have several of these cars. Like I said, I pick them up now uh, uh, at swap meets and what have you for a few bucks. Anytime I can find one, I, I purchase it. And you can see that I don't know what this particular item is, but you know I don't particularly care. It's an interesting load, a uh, lot of details on it, uh, probably a little bit more than I'd want to tackle the model uh, just because I'm, I'm not that good and I'm, I'm lazy. <clears throat> And the railroads have been hauling open loads for quite some time. I think uh, Fred Sword sent me this photo or somebody sent it to me. Um, Fred, was that you? Do you recall? I don't remember it. Okay, somebody sent this to me. And uh, what I like about it, it's, I mean, look at that flat car. I mean, the old, old school flat car. I mean, I, I don't know the date of this particular photo. Would that be around the 20s or 30s? I don't know. But uh, you can see even then, um, um, the railroads hauled super oversized loads. And they have all sorts of specialty cars. I mean, this car obviously is, uh, is more or less a series of beams. It doesn't have a bottom necessarily. You can see how the load drops down through the bottom of the car. And this is just the beam and I'm sure it's on either side with supports here. So uh, the railroad that can create whatever they need to, to uh, haul all sorts of specially unusual loads. And the bigger the load, typically the bigger the car, the more axles, the more wheels. And obviously these pivot here, and then there's these two trucks are attached to a single rod that pivot right here. So Now this particular load was interesting. It's a rather large load, but apparently it's not very heavy. That's a that's a, a two truck standard looking sixty foot flat car. So uh, it 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 must uh, be made of lightweight material, and it's probably a lot of hollow on the inside. It looks like some kind of farm machinery where they're doing grain or something. Who knows? But uh, it must not be very heavy to warrant only uh, uh, four axles. And this big guy, um, don't know what it is, all wrapped up. Um, I just saw this, I really liked it. The bright blue sky contrasting with the white covered load and the blue uh, Siemens identification. Um, uh, again, it's a uh, depressed center flat car with four trucks underneath it. So my buddy Sam Swanson sent me this. This is not a railroad load, obviously, but you know, this is uh, over the highway. That may be, uh, Mike or Steve, you think probably too large for the railroads to carry. I mean, look how wide that son of a gun is. Uh, I don't know what it is. Obviously it's laying on its side. Here are the pads that it would sit up on apparently. Um, maybe some big kind of grain bin or something because it was, looks like some kind of chute here at the bottom. But that is one monster of a load and it's hauling it above the highway and not on a railroad because perhaps it wouldn't fit on the railroad, who knows? Anyway, so now let's look at some very large prototype loads and my represent, representational models. 
key word in this sentence here is representational. I am not an exact modeler. If the thing had 10 rivets, I don't care if mine only has one, you know, I, I'm not a rivet counter. I make representational models. So this guy, I love this guy. <clears throat> Look at the weight here, 500 tons, 500 tons. I can't even imagine that kind of weight. And the manufacturers, and maybe this is from, obviously this is an older photograph, and maybe it was a trend back in the day, but look, look how they always advertise. You know, they're very proud, you know, built by Chicago Bridge and Iron Company for the Gulf Oil Corporation, you know, very proud of their product and they displayed it proudly on their, uh, uh, on the load itself. And again, uh, there you go, Mike, Southern Railway. Uh, again, another four truck, three axle truck, uh, double car load. I love this thing. So. This is my picture. I was in transit from New Jersey where I was living at the time to my home in Louisville. And uh, it was late at night. I was pulling into a rest area to make a pit stop before I made the final leg of my journey. And the crew had just unconnected the cab. They were parking this thing for the night. My guess is that the federal transportation regulations don't allow these guys to travel after dark. Anyway, they had just pulled, that's on the ramp leading into the uh, rest area. And I saw it, parked my car, came down in what light was left. And I took a picture of this monster. I have no idea how, how whoops, I have no idea how long it is. Uh, just look at the number of tires and so on and so forth. And, and the cab unit is, would have been way up here. And this is the back end of it. And this thing was fantastic. So. Uh, coupled with the previous photograph and coupled with this, I was going to create my own. Well, obviously, you know, I don't have unlimited space on a layout. So, so I made my tank somewhat smaller. That's still, that's an 89 foot flat car. So my load is just, just under a hundred feet. And that was actually um, a piece from a kit. I think it was concept models that I had bought um, I saw that they had advertised loads for snobble cars. I'll show you a picture of those a little bit later. And uh, I don't have a snobble car. I didn't at the time. And I said, I'm going to make a large tank load, just like the one that I saw being transferred over the highway, over the interstate system, and like that one other photograph. And of course, I had some decals left over from other kits. So just like the other guys, hey, you know, they're very, U.S. Steel is very proud of, of their uh, product. So they, they, they advertised it here. Uh, Imperial Tank Company is a subsidiary th that actually made the tank for them. A little couple of safety signs. And I just used to fasten this load. And again, Mike, you would probably fail all my loads, but um, I made some wooden chalks here, anti-road chalks. And then I used uh, uh, 1 16th inch ribbon that I it was white ribbon, ribbon that I soaked in um, uh, iced tea to, to make it a little darkish worn, give it to age it, to age that white, the white stuff. So, uh, so anyway, that's my super large tank load. <clears throat> this is a picture that was in a, uh, 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 I don't want to say a kit. It wasn't a kit. I was at a train show and I picked up a, uh, a steel mill ladle and a picture was in the kit of how they mounted this thing. So look at all this wood, you know, you talk about the oak and whatever it is. Look, look at, look at this thing. And this is on a standard flat car, not depressed at all, which makes it pretty tall. And look at the back of it. Look, look at all this wood and so on and so forth. So um, that was the unit that I bought and I had the photograph. So I just used a lot of scale lumber to try and create a similar uh, looking uh, deal. Uh, I made some, you know, these were steel deck flat cars. I had to use the press center because that's a tall load. They would a lot of times weld um, different mounting pieces so that you can run cable through there 
And that's what I did. I made some little mounting fixtures out of styrene, just drilled holes and run some heavy duty thread through there to represent cables. Uh, but what I really like, what I think makes the load look attractive is, the, is all the bracing and everything. So that's, that's, that's what I enjoy seeing. And again, is it prototypical? Well, you know, you saw the photograph. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. So again, this is a heavy load, not on a railroad, but on a, um, uh, uh, a semi, a, a flatbed semi, depressed center flatbed semi, because this is a large load. This is a tall load. And I loved all this change here. So um, that's a kit. Um, I bought the kit and I bought some scale chain and it's not real chain it's actually um uh laser cut wood that they kind of laser cut to make it look like chain so in the photograph you can't tell in fact i remember i i, I built this load and i sent it out this is you know pre-covid and all this to a couple of guys and and russ weiss responded he said uh he said bob i like the load tell me about the chain <laughs> so i think the chain is the eye catcher on this load but anyway um, you know, these kits and, and the name of the, the manufacturer escapes me. I apologize for that. Um, you know, it's, they build up very nicely and they have all the appropriate, uh, you know, decals and things like that. You, you spray paint them. So, you know, there's the prototype and that's a pretty good representation. So, uh, the kit, the, the company does a good job. All I did is put it together and spray paint it. Uh, same company, that's their prototype load. They actually make this and that. I own all three and they're titled extreme load number one, number two, and number three. So they're very creative in their names. And there's the load. And what I like about this, it's got little uh, flanges that they welded to the car and they welded to the load itself, okay? for shipping purposes. And they welded a flange here. These are the lifting fixtures, right? To lift it. Um, and I use what uh, tie rods, except I just welded my rods on place. You know, I didn't, I didn't bolt them. I just welded them on. And so there's the load. So between the being welded at the base here and being welded on the sides, I think hopefully that would be secured pretty well. Um, that's a wind turbine blade. It's a whole train of them. American Model Builders makes a kit. Uh, they make the blade and they also make the, uh, the housing uh, that powers it. Um, I was, that wasn't as interesting as the blade. So I bought the blade. Uh, it comes not only with, it's a, a urethane casting, I think, but it comes with these little fixtures, very simple, you know, two or three pieces, you build them up, got a little strap here to, to hold it. Uh, I did, you know, sand this a little bit, painted it white. Uh, I might add a, a red cap like the, like the prototype photo here, the little red thing at the end. I don't know. But anyway, um, very nice kit. And you can see the idler car here because of the overhang it would have. This looks like some kind of tower for a refinery. And again, you know, here's the bolster, but it's two cars, right? So here's the bolster points um, where they supposedly pivot and or maybe slide back and forth two or three inches or whatever. But it looks like it, it looks like it doesn't even pivot. It looks like it's rigid, but it I don't think it would go around the turn if it wasn't if it wasn't uh, uh, able to pivot on that bolster point. So my representation of this is that um, those are uh, pieces that I got on eBay from the Volmer refinery kit. Uh, you know, the, the kit sells, and this was, you know, 10 years ago, whenever I built this, the kit sold then for $75. Well, I wasn't going to buy a kit just to make one load. And, um, and I just, I don't know, went on eBay and the guy had these pieces for 20 bucks. And I said, oh, that's a lot better than 75. So I bought the pieces. I think there are six pieces here. I hid the seams with some little strip styrene. Uh, I just added some little, um, you know, brake wheels here, valves, a uh, little cover. I think that's a cover for a, from a tank car of some sort, I think. It's just miscellaneous pieces that I had in my 
you know, the rivets are already part of the, of, of the, uh, of the model itself. So that was great. And then of course, what I like is figuring out how am I going to mount this thing? How am I, especially I use the depressed center flat car. I probably didn't have to, but it's a heavy duty car and I didn't have a heavy duty plain flat car. So I had to fill this in and I just made some kind of cribbing with uh, scale lumber. And again, I made some little tie down things that would be welded to the to steel plate, a steel deck of the flat car. And uh, I just made it up and, um, and tied it down with some, some thread. And um, that's, that's all of that. Now, this guy, Dave Davies, uh, maybe you've heard of him. He's, uh, he is the open lows expert. So there's his version of that refining tower, and it spans what three cars. So no, so these guys are modelers. You know, I'm just I'm an average guy who builds average models, and you know, if they look okay, that's good enough for me. But look at this guy. Look how he mounts this thing. You know, I mean, th this thing looks like it could have been the real thing. And uh, and look at his flat cars, man. I mean, he this guy is Altum uh, is the ultimate uh, flat car uh, open load builder. I can't hold a candle to him, no way. So I mentioned the Schnabel car. It's a very specialized car to carry the heaviest of loads. And look at the number of, golly, I don't even, even count them up. I think, what are they, like 32 or 34 on each side, whatever they are, and, you know, 60 plus wheels on this thing. And there's another one. Again, very long, very uh, specialty cars. You know, the, the cars, expand right here depending on the length of the load and of course you know i when bachman came out with their schnabel car i just had to purchase it and uh there it is just you know obviously don't run this i just hey i like open loads so uh, you know my my collection wouldn't be complete without a schnabel car so uh i purchased it uh and it's a really interesting car and these things and the prototype they have uh in these control houses here, because you talk about the clearance issues, the cars can pivot a certain amount from one side to the other along the, uh, I guess, the horizontal axis parallel or uh, perpendicular to the track. So they can, they can, they can, they can move one way or the other uh, at either end. So the A end and B end of the car, uh, really interesting. So this is going to be one of the next loads that I build. I've been working with uh, Russ and um, and Bruce McKeon, uh, who's been a, both have been uh, invaluable help on this car. So this is a large I beam, and notice the length of this. This is three flat cars. I don't know if those are forty foot flat cars. My guess is because of the age of this photo, they might be forty foot, not fifty. But anyway. That's a, and once again, they advertise built by, boy, you know, that must've been the thing. If you're going to build something and it's going to go on, that's free advertising for your company. So um, this is going to be my next project. This is one that Russ, the picture that Russ sent me, it's fantastic. Uh, Russ took the photograph on his layout, complete with the elevated, super elevated curves there. And the load itself was built by Bruce, and he did a fantastic job. And I, what, what, what I'm attracted to about this load, aside from the beam, is just, just how he mounted it here. And, you know, I thought he scratch built all this, but then he told me, he said, no, this is part of a kit, actually. Sunshine Models made the kit for this I-beam that he has on his, which has rivets and everything. It's a really nice kit. And, but he built this uh, from scratch out of styrene for Russ. And, and when Russ sent me this photograph, I said, Russ, I got I to gotta build this load. I mean, it, it's, I, I just love that. I mean, who doesn't like that? And so, uh, so thank you, Russ, and thank you, Bruce, for your uh, uh, cooperation and um, um, helping me. Uh, hopefully, I doubt mine will look that good, but, but it'll be representational, and that's really all I'm after. So. This is uh, an I-beam I built from a kit. Uh, I want to say American Model Builders. I, I, I can't remember if it is or not. And it's, it's nice. You know, it has some uh, holes there. You can put rivets and all that. Uh, it has some nice mounting hardware. It's, it's not as complete with all the ribbing and everything. But it's, it's, that's what I have now. But I'm going to build, I think, a, a little bit better one. 
So some of you that know me know that I worked for the Navy for 38 years and I worked with Navy gunnery. And of course the 16 inch guns were before my time, but through my travels to the different places, I've got to see a lot of these. I was even on board the battleship Missouri uh, when it was a uh, uh, mothball fleet up in Bremerton, Washington. And uh, for $2, you could tour the ship or parts of the ship, not all of it. And these things are humongous. And <clears throat> Uh, they did move by rail, as you can obviously see. Uh, the guy, uh, Bruce DeYoung, up in the president of the Northeast East region, he saw my clinic at the, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where I had my model, and then he sent me this photograph. He said, hey, because I didn't have a model of the prototype, so now I do. And if you still want to see a live one, you can go to Delaware and in the uh, Fort Miles, it's a state park up there. It's a, sort of a recreation that used to be a, 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 a gun emplacement for shore protection during World War II, because you didn't, they didn't know at the time, you know, are our shores vulnerable, will we likely be attacked? And so they, they had, some, had some shoreline defenses. And this is a, uh, a park that you can go to, and that's one of the guns on display. And there's my model, and this is American Model Builders. It's a very nice kit with a, with a lot, I think a lot of detail in the bracing here. It's, it's uh, uh, not a kit for beginners, um, but if you do it right, take your time. Uh, I'd build it a little bit differently. I think I, would, I wouldn't make the gun a, a barrel of uniform color. The reason I did that, because when we overhauled some of the five inch guns in Louisville, we were, we'd paint them navy gray and they were all, you know, I'd see them, they'd all be all solid gray, brand new, and they look, you know, look great. So that's, in my mind, that's what I had. But anyway, you can see some of the mounting hardware and um, uh, the nut and bolt castings and, and, and all. So pretty nice, pretty nice load to build. Farm equipment. I saw this kit at a swap meet. Uh, for half price because these kits sell for about $40. I picked it up for 20 and I thought I could get a couple of loads out of that so I could get the load of the combine itself, you know, because the wheels would protrude too much. I took those off and built a little um, scratch, built a little pallet here for them, uh, tied it down, used some little ribbon here to represent so the cables wouldn't cut through the, through the softer rubber tire. Um, this is just a crate I had in my inventory. And then the second load, these were the two attachments that came there, you know, for doing corn and for doing wheat, um, uh, the different uh, attachments. So I just scratch build these two crates. You know, um, I do better with, with scale lumber than I do with styrene. I don't build much out of styrene. I just, I don't wood. Uh, I'm a repressed carpenter, I think. But anyway, um, so I built those crates and I just put them on the flat car. So I got two load for 20 bucks. I got two nice loads. Uh, this is a heavy duty load. Mike had a, one of his uh, AAR drawings. I think he had uh, how they do the, the wooden blocks and, you know, and the chains. It probably looks just like Mike's photograph there, uh, his drawing, AAR drawing. And that's my representation of that load. So the latest project, I shouldn't say the latest, one of the latest, I, I actually in the in the last June was the first gathering I think we had, you know, COVID and all that. And I did a little, I think, six uh, slide program on different things. So this started, uh, Fred Sword, I know you sent me this article, Fred, because I remember. Sure Fred, is. Fred sent me an article, and I can't remember what it was. And I looked at it, and it had this it had a load that was built and it had this prototype picture much smaller so the company it's a new company called uh uh multi-scale digital and they've been in business now about i don't know maybe two years maybe three years they do 3d printing of a lot of loads and where they get their source information is from um customers that send them photographs and they happen to get a treasure trove from a defunct from the defunct Bethlehem Steel um, company. So when I saw this and I saw the load that the guy built out of this, I said, I, I got to do that. So I ordered it. 
came in, I built the load, and then I said, I want to feature this in the magazine. So I got a hold of the company and said, hey, can I use that picture? Do you have copyright to this picture right here? I want it to be in the magazine. He didn't have copyright to it. He said, that's how he told me the story of how he got it from one of his clients sent it into him. It was a whole stack of photographs from Bethlehem Steel. And I said, great. So long story short, I told my story to the attorney at the NMRA and they said, hey, this photograph predates 1955. In all likelihood, I'm going to allow you to use it because we don't have to worry about anything before 1955, you know, based on the guy's dress and his hairstyle and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, I did uh, feature this several months ago in the magazine. And when you have the actual prototype load and then you show the load that you built, you know, it to me, that's, you know, it ties it together. So here's the real thing and here's my representational model. So notice in, in a prototype, it's not on a rail car or anything. It's just sitting in their factory. So how did they mount this thing? Well, you know, I don't know how they mounted it. I don't have a picture of it on a rail car. So here's my Athern heavy duty flat car with the four, uh, four trucks. So I just scratch built some kind of a fixture here. And uh, then I had some leftover uh, uh, nut and bolt castings that I just put on here so that these things would have been that so that mounting fixture would have been drilled uh, or secured directly to the steel deck of the flat car. Um, and I advertised it, you know, US Steel is very proud of this. So they made it, um, mounted it up here. We're not going to hump this guy because, you know, um, it's not a smart thing to do. It weighs a lot. And so that's, 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 my, uh, that's my representation of that, of how that would have been mounted on the flat car. And gentlemen, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you for allowing me to uh, talk a little bit of my nonsense to you. And uh, hopefully um, you all maybe learn something or at least were entertained, if nothing else. Well, Mike Barry, I, I do think you better get over to Frank Rohn's house and the pretty quick and do a, a load inspection please and get him straightened yeah. out and <laughs> the loads that aren't ready to move yeah well you know they're all they're all when bob has them they all stay at their home point anyway so hey what's <laughs> yeah, the problem that's, that's true most of, them are, clearance file, you know? most of them most of them are in boxes you know i mean so yeah. i can't uh no. no i would never do something like that no no you mentioned that last one that last load uh, without looking at any kind of a drawing, I would imagine it probably needs some kind of cables through the top bearing right. points on it down at, at, at opposite directions just to, to keep it from getting um, too top heavy to, to actually pull it off the flat. Well, now Bob, now Bob knows where to look up the yeah, load that, on the manual and that's right. get those on there. That's right. Yep, it's all right there. It surprised me when I was checking into this a, a month or so ago, because uh, I no longer have access to what was used to be the binder. So I thought, you know what, that's probably not how they do it anymore. Of course, you know, we're talking about measuring the loads. They probably have a guy out there does all that with a laser now, I'm quite sure. They don't need to crawl around on those loads. They can uh, they can do all that sitting on the ground with a laser. I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure a little bit of geometry and you're ready to go. Um, so yeah, well, that one thing you just go to AAR dot dot uh, org, and then you'll see they're listed as O T uh, L R capital letters O T L R open top loading rule. You go to the hit that link, and there you are. We're running a little long here today, folks. So if you need to leave, we can understand that it's been an interesting subject. And we can certainly continue on uh, with any other further questions. Uh, very nice presentation from our three presenters. So if you do have to leave, thanks for joining us. If you want to stay around and ask questions, we'd be happy to stay here and, and help you listen to them. <laughs>